thank you for having us in La Jolla. Um, the last time I was here, Warwick's invited me, and it was for the mermaid chair. And we ha I remember this vividly because um, Warwick's was so creative, and we had that wonderful um, mermaid cookies. Oh. <laughs> um, and, and nice tea. It was such a nice time. So I have such nice memories of being in La Jolla. And so now to come back with my daughter is really nice. And I want to thank um, the library for inviting us and Warwick's for sponsoring this as well. Does this turn on? Oh. The images that you've been looking at uh, are somehow part of the book. There are little glimpses, I guess you would say, little windows into the book. We wanted to um, offer a little bit of an, a, a feeling tone of the book itself. And somehow or another, all of those images figure into the story somehow. When people ask um, Anne and I about what we were doing, and we would say, well, we were writing a book together. Invariably, the first thing people said to us was, are you still speaking? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it was about that, but it's, it got to be kind of um, revealing, actually, how many times we heard that. It was almost um, nine times out of 10. Somebody, when they found out we were co-authoring a book as mother and daughter, they'd say, are you still speaking? So Anne and I were very amused by this, and then we would sort of raise our eyebrows and go, what's going on with that? I, I think it probably is indicative of just how loaded the mother-daughter relationship can really get. Um, then, it was last week, we were being interviewed, and this um, radio uh, interviewer said, so my, your mother and daughter wrote a book together? I'm, I can't believe, didn't you want to kill each other? And Anne said, wow, this thing got stepped up from not speaking. <laughs> you know, to killing each other. So it's been very interesting to see this kind of reaction. And uh, I think Anne and I both say that writing this book together has been a deepening experience for our relationship, actually. It's brought us closer together in a lot of ways. It challenged us in it. Um, revealed a lot about one another. I learned things about Anne during the writing of this book that I did not know. Um, as I was reading her chapters, I go, well, I didn't know that. Uh, I, and I thought we had uh, really bonded in, in Greece and I had learned so much about her and then as we were writing the book, I learned so much more. Um, I learned that she had this amazing romance when she was a college student. <laughs> and she went on, I sent her, you know, her father and I sent her to Greece to, on this college study trip for a semester. <laughs> I learned about this incredible Greek student that she met over there, which she tells that story in Traveling with Pomegranates. Um, I learned that she didn't want to become a writer, that she fought it because I was a writer. Um, she learned things about me. Uh, she learned that I actually uh, had conflicts about my time, torn between my own desire to pursue my own life and my writing and, and motherhood. You know, just kind of torn with that conflict. This was a surprise to her. I thought, now it's not. She has a child of her own. <laughs> I think you could argue that the mother-daughter relationship is perhaps the most emotionally charged, um, closest maybe, um, maybe most conflicted sometimes relationship there is. I mean, it is a very can be very ambivalent and and very close at the same time. I came across some lines by Adrian Rich, wonderful poet that I love. And she, I think it might be the most evocative and beautiful lines about the mother-daughter relationship I've ever read. And I want to read them to you. <clears throat> she says, probably there is nothing in human nature more resonant with the charges than the flow of energy between two biologically alike bodies 
one of which has lain in amniotic bliss inside the other, one of which has labored to give birth to the other. The materials are here for the deepest mutuality and the most painful estrangement. And then there's what Lillian Carter, President Carter's mother said. She said, sometimes when I look at my children, I say to myself, Lillian, you should have stayed a virgin. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. All of that is to say that mother-daughter relationships are rarely casual, they're rarely irrelevant, and they're rarely finished. Mm -hmm. Well, writing the book together was my idea, but I really had absolutely no idea what I was getting into. Mm -hmm. Initially, I set out to write this book by myself, but after working on it for years, I realized I was only telling half the story. It just seemed like my mom's story and her voice really needed to be in there too. And not long after that, around my 27th birthday, I was talking to mom and I heard myself say, well, why don't you write the book with me? That was the spring of 2003 and she was gearing up to write The Mermaid Chair, so my timing was awful. But to my surprise, she said, I'd love to. And then she paused and sounding very serious at it, but I want you to be really, really sure. And I was sure until she said that. <laughs> <laughs> A few years ago, my mom had some quotations stenciled on the walls that lead up to her study. I would read them from time to time when I go over there. The one at the very top is by French novelist Emile Zola. If you ask me what I came to do in this world, I, as an artist, will answer you. I am here to live out loud. It occurred to me that writing a book with my mother could mean living a lot louder than I thought. <laughs> it can be fairly terrifying making yourself audible in the world to put your voice out there. And I did suddenly feel like I was jumping off the deep end. But I heard my mother say that she became a novelist by diving in over her head. She was always saying things like, if you're going to err, err on the side of audacity. So I thought, okay, let's do that. Well, recently I've discovered the only thing more audacious than writing a book with my mother is going on book tour. <laughs> 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 well, what Anne didn't know is that it felt like jumping off the deep end for me too, because I've never written a book with anyone beside myself. So I had no idea really how to do it either. So Anne and I sort of leaped together and we figured it out. I think I was always saying things to Anne like, air on the side of audacity, because that has always been exactly the thing I needed to hear myself, particularly with my writing. I've always had to um, tell myself that it's all about courage. The book covers three trips that Anne and I made together over the course of three years. Uh, first to Greece and Turkey, and then the next year to France, and then back to Greece again. It took us um, three years almost to write this book. Anne likes to figure things up, and she said to me one day, you know, we traveled for 40 days, and it took us 1,095 to write about them. <laughs> it was a lot more days writing about them than we thought it was going to be. Uh, what I found out is that instead of cutting things in half and you co-author a book with someone, it actually doubles everything. So it makes it more complicated somehow, more challenging, but also more satisfying and more wonderful in ways, too. Um, I have been asked many times, what was it like to write a book with your daughter? And, um, and I heard myself say one time, well, Traveling with Pomegranates is the hardest book I have ever written, hands down. Now, up until that, it was The Dance of the Dissident Daughter. <laughs> that was the hardest book I had to write. But um, it was definitely this book for a lot of reasons. But then I heard myself say, but it's also the most satisfying, it's the one I'm the proudest of. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and I 
will stand by that statement. I, it's, it's absolutely true how I feel about it. Um, I wrote at my house, Anne wrote at her house, which is about 15 minutes away, and we each would come together after we had a first draft of our chapters and sit um, there and read in each other's presence. I'd read what she wrote, she'd read what I wrote. The first day that we exchanged chapters, uh, we noticed that we had each written a little description of one another. You don't get to see yourself through your mother's eyes or your daughter's eyes all that often, I guess. Um, you know, if you were going to say, if you had a chance to just say three paragraphs about your mother or your daughter out of everything you could say, what would you say? I mean, it's a little more daunting than you think. Um, so we want to read these little descriptions to you. I think we were both intrigued to see what you know, we had written about each other. Um, I, I have to warn you, I feel like I must warn you, that what we're about to read is just unduly positive. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to say quickly that there is no lack of unflattering and deprecating and brutally honest descriptions of us in this book. Oh, we, in that case, we wrote them ourselves. <laughs> now, here's what I wrote about Anne. If you ask me to describe Anne, the first thing I would say is smart. Her intelligence was never just scholastic, though. It has always had a creative, inventive bent. When other eight-year-olds were busy with the lemonade stands, Anne set up a booth for dispensing advice for people with problems. <laughs> <laughs> Minor problems cost a nickel, major ones a dime. She made a killing. On the other hand, it must be said that Anne's defining quality is kindness. I don't mean politeness so much as tender-heartedness. Growing up, she railed against animal abuse and was unable to bear even the thought of a squash bug, insisting we carry all insects from the house in dustpans. Indeed, whatever her sensitive and fiery heart attached itself to, she was passionate about it. Bugs, dogs, horses, books, dolls, comic strips, save the earth, Movies, Hello Kitty, Star Wars. <laughs> well, before I read what I wrote about my mother, I want to mention that we both kept a quotation on our desk while we worked on this book. It's by the poet Anais Nin and says, the role of the writer is not to say what we all can say, but what we are unable to say. And this passage I'm going to read had that feel to it, like it was something I had been unable to say to my mom. <clears throat> Sitting beside the Parthenon, I spot my mom in the distance, taking pictures of the sculpted columns of women on the porch of the Caryatids. She wrote about the Caryatids in her book, The Dance of the Dissident Daughter. She described them as an embodiment of strong women bearing up. Women who bear the weight of opposition, she wrote, create a shelter for the rest of us. The Dance of the Dissident Daughter was published my sophomore year in college. When I opened it and saw it was dedicated to me, I read it like a mother's letter, a mother's letter to her daughter. Sometimes forgetting her story was being read by thousands of other people. <laughs> At times it seemed beyond weird that we lived in the same house during those years. I'd known so little about what she struggled with inside. Mostly, I knew her as my mother, the one who stayed up half the night decorating my Raggedy Ann birthday cake who indulged me by creating the Coke Pepsi challenge in the kitchen for Bob and me, who helped me pick out my black cotillion dress, who taught me how to parallel park at the DMV. <laughs> but when I finished Dissident Daughter, I glimpsed her for the first time as a woman, like one of those beautiful caryatids she's standing with now. Well, that was lovely for me to read that. And I really think that such moments, you know, when you see your mom or your daughter outside those tightly scripted roles that we so often 
interact and only know each other through those roles, if we can sort of break out of that momentarily and see each other in a completely new way, it can open up whole new ways of relating. And I think that might have been such a moment for Anne. The truth is that Anne and I never really had one of those um, pyrotechnic relationships that mothers and daughters have sometimes or that are written about so famously in books. Uh, we certainly participated, however, in the very classic mother-daughter struggles that I think are pretty universal for, for most mothers and daughters. And I want to articulate that struggle, kind of a thumbnail of it, how I understand it and how it's often described in depth psychology. On one hand, you have a mother who is trying to let her daughter go really all throughout her life. And at the same time, unconsciously seeing her daughter as an appendage of herself. So you can see how really confusing that can get beneath the surface for her. And then on the other hand, you have a daughter who is wired to please her mother and even pattern herself in her mother's image. But at the same time, is wired to uh, create an identity separate from her mother. So you have the makings here for the most interesting kinds of goings on beneath the surface. When the book opens, it is the summer of 1998. I'm turning 50. And Anne has just graduated from college. So to mark these two milestones in our lives, I decide we should go to Greece together, just the two of us. Uh, what I was not really aware of then was that the, this um, classic struggle I've tried to describe was beginning to surface and be stirred up by these very milestones we were going over there to celebrate. When Anne was at college, a lot of distance had grown between us, a lot of silence. I mean, here was a young woman that I hardly knew anymore. Uh, we had outgrown our relationship the one where, the only one we knew, which was I was the mommy and she was the little girl. And I think we both sensed a finality to that, but we didn't really know how to shift the conversation between us to anything else. So it was during that first trip to Greece, within the first 36 hours actually, that I was hit right between the eyes with how Painfully, I missed her. And with this understanding that we were going to need to rediscover one another and completely reinvent this relationship in some way that I had no idea how to do. We hadn't been in Greece very long at all when we bumped into the Demeter and Persephone myth. Mm -hmm. It's about a mother who is starting to age a little and her daughter who's on the cusp of young womanhood. When the daughter goes missing, her mother mounts a passionate search to find her, and in the end, there is a reunion. It's essentially a story about loss, search, and return, and I think we were surprised to realize that it was our story, too. We'd like to read two brief passages that highlight this mother-daughter relationship and the old motif of loss, search, and return that runs through it. But the readings also touch on a second major theme in the book which is about crossing the thresholds of womanhood at two ends of life. I was trying to figure out the beginnings of being a woman, and my mom was trying to figure out the beginnings, the ending of it. She describes her transit into older womanhood, which had a sort of turbulence. And let's just say, my passage into young womanhood was not smooth sailing, to say the least. <laughs> After college, a lot of young women are grappling with what to do with their lives. They're trying to understand who they are inside, what they believe, looking for independence, trying to figure out relationships. It kind of becomes an all around what it means to take on life. The summer after I graduated, I felt sort of confused and lost. I had actually no idea what I was going to do with my life. I suffered a bitter disappointment that left me feeling like a failure. And for the first time in my life, I was depressed. This first passage takes place during our very first trip together. 
aboard a ship docked off the coast of Turkey. Up until this point, I've been withholding my feelings from my mother. As I wrote in the book, every day was an acting class. I could not seem to tell her what I was going through, and I felt a kind of partition between us, a kind of room divider marking our space. I just did not confide personal matters and inner thoughts to her. You know, in other words, the very particulars of my soul. But this conversation changed all of that and became a real turning point. So picture mom and me sitting on the, the ship's deck beneath a, at a table beneath the blue umbrella, and it's all very congenial and nice, but very well partitioned. When out of nowhere, I unintentionally say something that hints at the state I'm in. I'm going to pick up right there. Mom adjusts her chair so her eyes are out of the sun, then takes off her sunglasses. She looks at me, seriously looks at me. Her eyes are locked on mine, the expression of someone who knows she has happened upon a moment of impending truth and is not about to retreat from it. What do you mean, Anne, she says. I press my fingers against the corners of my eyes and decide I will not cry. I stare at my napkin, blue like the umbrella. As soon as I look up, Mom will finally know how sad I am and I won't be able to spare her anymore. I force myself to meet her brown eyes. She gives me a small, sad smile. For one or two seconds, I can tell she sees me in a way I cannot see myself. My eyes fill and her face goes blurry. I fight for composure. If I start to cry, I'm afraid I won't finish till the ship docks again in Athens. She reaches for my hand. It's okay, just tell me, Mom says. Suddenly, the words are in my mouth and I'm saying them. I'm just depressed. Her fingers tighten on mine. I knew something was going on, she says. I'm sorry, I should have asked you about it. When did all this start? When the letter came, I tell her. She wrinkles up her forehead. The letter, the grad school letter, the one confirming my anatomies. I hear the smart ass tone in my voice, but for some reason, it helps to keep me from falling apart. But that was last March, she says, and her eyes widen. For the next hour, it all pours out, the whole miserable thing. What it was like the day I got the letter, how I hid it in my sock drawer, the way things went from bad to worse, the depression taking over. I tell my mother how afraid I am inside, how lost, how rejected I feel, how the letter had unearthed my own self-doubt and feelings of unworthiness, then the shame that I was not good enough. I cannot hold back anymore. I drop my head on the table and cry. I feel mom's hand on the back of my head, and I cry harder. <laughs> It is whole minutes before I can stop. I use the napkin to wipe my nose. The wait staff is having a whispered conversation that I can only imagine. <laughs> Crazy girl on deck, call the ship's doctor. <laughs> Mom scoots forward in her chair. Now she knows. Anne, listen to me. I understand how the rejection letter snowballed into a rejection of yourself and how depressed you became but all those things you love about Athena that you found in yourself before, they're still in you, I promise. They just seem lost to you right now, okay? I nod. I know Mom wants to say the right thing to me. I can see how hard she's trying, going slowly, measuring her words, her eyes brimming. I want to tell her she doesn't have to say anything, that her hearing all this is what matters. But then she says, you deserve to love yourself. And it hits me suddenly how true that is. As Anne said, um, a significant thread, a motif in this book is about these transitions we were both in. At 50, I could feel my young woman self packing up to leave. <laughs> <laughs> the same way I could sense Anne leaving. You know, as I wrote in the book, those were the days I examined my face in the mirror like a seismologist studying <laughs> unstable tectonic plates. <laughs> I mean, the young woman leaving in us, mm -hmm. 
becomes apparent in a whole lot of ways. Um, it wasn't just in the physical changes, you know, you see in your face and your body. Um, there were changes um, within that I was also picking up on. Like this irrepressible need I suddenly had to leave my old geography and move to a completely new place. Which I took to be something about leaving an internal landscape and going to some very new place inside of myself. And I felt this young woman leaving too in what had happened with my writing. When I finished writing The Dance of the Dissident Daughter, I, um, I sensed that I would have to completely change my whole course as a writer. And I had a lot of dreams and desires as a writer that I had not acted on, and I was very worried that my writing had completely gone to seed, and in a way it had gone to seed. And there was a fallowness going on in me at that time. Um, I, I guess I was mostly afraid that I couldn't generate the potency for that third act in life that you want. Now, I realize that 50 is the new 40. <laughs> I understand that. But I also sort of sense that beneath the rhetoric, the cultural rhetoric about all of that, that something really is ending inside. Um, maybe not at 50 for everyone, maybe it's 60, or maybe it's 70, or maybe it's 45 or 55. I mean, it's different for everyone, but there seems to be some moment when you begin to sense a crossing and something ends. The young woman really does pack up and go. Now, the paradoxical thing about that, which I tried to write about in the book, is that she does return, but in a completely new way. Not in her physicality, but in some other sort of potent, vibrant way that brings in new life. So it's the, it's the fusion of meeting the old woman and the return of the new woman that creates this renaissance, I think, in, in women at this crossing over. So I was starting to get that the real course was to learn how to embrace this older woman I was becoming anyway and try to find the renaissance in that, in becoming older, although it was terrifying and I had no idea what that meant. But I did at least intuitively know somewhere deep inside that there is a real odyssey that the feminine soul wants to make around this time. And for me, at least, it starts with acknowledging this sense of loss and being honest about it. Um, and then that allows you to let go and make room for the new, the new life that really does want to come. Now, in this passage, I'm going to read, um, I think you'll see me sort of uh, enmeshed in, in this process of sensing those beginnings of all of that and the loss of it. Don't let me wear pink to your wedding, I say. <laughs> Anne and I sit at a table in the cafe below the Louvre Museum's glass pyramid and talk not about all the sublime art we've just seen, but about wedding outfits. That's right. <laughs> not powder blue either, and no jacket with shoulder pads. <laughs> I promise, says Anne. Her wedding date is set, June 3rd seven months away, but already we've spent a lot of Sunday afternoons making wedding plans. As I tell my friends, I've rented the tree. I love that she picked out a 500-year-old moss-laden oak to be her church. We have a guest list of 120, which is about all the people we can sit beside it. She will walk down a path to the tree that cuts through a rose garden. Floral arrangements would be redundant. I am sincerely happy about the wedding and I adore Scott, but several times since Anne called me with the news, I felt a small wrench at the back of my heart. I know it isn't about her, it's about me. But I don't know precisely what the feeling is. A longing, a sadness, the baton passing again. 
I'm eating some sort of sandwich that I fear could be spread with goose liver. I push it aside and drink my demi impression. My mind goes to the classic moment in the tale of Snow White when the mother is eclipsed by the daughter. The queen consults her magic mirror. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all? She expects to hear her own name called as usual, but her stepdaughter has recently become a young woman and the queen is getting crow's feet. Snow White, the mirror blurts, and zap, the queen is dealt her first shock of age. Perhaps all mothers of daughters possess a secret talking mirror that announces when their young womanhood begins to fade and their daughters begins to blossom. As in the fairy tale, the experience can unleash a lacerating jealousy in some mothers, which turns up like poison apples on the daughter's doorstep. It can also usher in fears that I would have sworn I'd never have, of invisibility, anonymity, irrelevance, and deeper down, fears of decline and death. That night in the hotel bathroom, I stand at the sink exhausted. Tired from the flight and the walking, I just want to go to bed. I squirt toothpaste onto my toothbrush, and when Anne appears in the doorway with her cosmetic bag, I step over to make room for her at the sink. As we stand side by side and brush our teeth before the mirror, I gradually become aware that despite my fatigue, I am watching her face. Miro, Miro, she is so beautiful. When I look back, it is clear that Mom and I both were on a spiritual and creative quest. Writing, creativity, and spiritual renewal are certainly motifs in the book as well. The book covers the period that Mom was discovering the Black Madonna, grappling with becoming a novelist, and writing The Secret Life of Bees. I was discovering what I call my triptych of icons, Athena, Mary, and Joan of Arc. Yes, it's an odd group. <laughs> but each one of them spoke to me in a certain way. Icons are meant to start up important conversations inside of us, ones that we really need to have with ourselves. Probably the reason I was drawn to Athena, Mary, and Joan was because they represented the represented things that I really needed. Joan of Arc represented courage. She was a warrior girl, charging through Paris on horseback, commanding an army um, at 17. She believed that's what she'd been born to do, and she did it with unbelievable courage. Well, that was what I needed, to find my purpose and a healthy dose of bravery. I experienced Mary as this very maternal and loving figure and I needed to find those qualities. The ability to be maternal and loving with myself. My first connection, though, was with Athena. She came to represent a way of relating to myself, of belonging to myself. I realized on one of these trips that I forfeited too much of myself in a relationship, and I didn't want to do that again. I didn't want to lose myself again. Athena helped me keep my eye on that. But the other thing that was happening on these trips was that I was waking up to the seemingly crazy notion that I might become a writer myself. So the final two passages we would like to read focus on the writing aspect of our individual searches. To set up my reading, I should probably say that in the aftermath of my rejection from graduate school, I've been struggling with what to do with my life. I was looking for what I thought of as my necessary fire some work with which I had a deep compatibility and true affinity, and also had the ability to bring me alive. It's a task. This piece occurs during our second trip. It is raining. The cold, wet pellets hitting hard against the windows, and the road is slick and black. We are on our way to Font de Gomme to visit a 15,000-year-old cave. The thought of being underground inside a cave makes me uneasy. Apparently, it has a gallery of art inside, wall paintings by late prehistoric people. I imagine them in there, drawn by torchlight while woolly mammoths roam around outside. 
I remember being in an art history class and seeing several slides of paintings from the Lascaux cave, which is not far from here. The horses in the slides have looked flat and primitive, stirring nothing in me like the images of ancient Greek sculpture had. I understand that paintings in Font de Gaulle are renowned, but unless one of them depicts Wilma Flintstone vacuuming the hell of Trump, I don't expect to be blown away. After a short climb from the bottom of the valley of a rock-crusted hill, we reach the cave opening. Our French guide, who has a red bandana tied around her hair, turns on her flashlight and leads us inside. Watch your step, she calls. I flip on my flashlight. There's enough oxygen down here, isn't there? I ask Mom. I guess, she says. She guesses. I was kind of joking around, and she guesses. <laughs> The group gathers around a frieze where five well-preserved bison are painted on vanilla-colored limestone. The guide flips on two cigarette lighters beside the painting. As the flames wave, the animals seem to come alive. Shadows cut back and forth, creating an uncanny image of running bison. The animals were drawn firmly, and without the slightest hint of hesitation, the guide says, as I listen to her wax on about the confidence of the cave painters, I consider my own lack of it. I stare at the bison. Whatever it is I am born to do, my fear of failing at it has, become, has almost become greater than my desire to figure out what it is. I remember my prayer to Joan of Arc in the chapel at Notre Dame. I want to know what I was born for. I want the courage to do it. I feel like I've been spinning my wheels stuck between the need I have to blaze my own path, doing something that doesn't resemble my mother's work, and the inclination I have towards writing. I treated writing a little like the rebound boyfriend, a fling not to be taken seriously. I resisted writing because I thought there had to be more to it than these impulses I keep having, or the fact I enjoy doing it, or even the belief I might become reasonably good at it. But now I'm wondering, if all these things are the very ways my true self speaks. Writing. Growing up, it's all I wanted to do. Now I feel the way it pulls at me. Not like a dramatic allurement, but like I've been away from home and have returned to the quiet things I love. When the book begins, as I suggested, I was definitely in a creative vacuum. I'd been harboring this passion to write fiction, uh, an impulse to become a novelist for some time, actually, though I had not acted on it, not really. Uh, I was also simultaneously carrying around the tiniest seed of an idea uh, for The Secret Life of Bees, vacillating about it. Should I write it? Should I not write it? Should I try to write fiction? Should I not try to write fiction? I mean, I was really not erring on the side of audacity at all. I was erring on the side of safety. And I think it was not only that. I was um, just languishing at that time. I mean, things were still fallow. And I didn't quite have all the clarity I needed to propel me forward with all of this. But it was during this very first trip to Greece that I had an experience that, oddly enough, uh, propelled me and crystallized things for me in, in what was actually a very profound way. And I came home and really never looked back after that. I was not aware the Virgin Mary had a house anywhere much less in the woods on the summit of a mountain in Turkey. <laughs> Supposedly, she lived out her life there as an old woman. The house is tiny, L-shaped, made of sand-colored stone with high windows and two petite rounded domes on the roof. We sit on a stone wall beside the door to wait our turn to enter. I slide my hand to the hollow of my neck and feel the sterling silver bead charm on my necklace. I bought the bee six or seven months ago for no reason except I felt drawn to it. Maybe the pull I felt was simple nostalgia. When I was growing up, bees lived inside a wall of our house, making honey that sometimes leaked out onto the floor. The wall would hum, 
Sometimes the house would hum. After I told Mary in the Myrtle Tree that I wanted to be a novelist, I came home and wrote a first chapter about a girl whose bedroom wall is full of bees that slip through the cracks and fly around at night. I even took it off to a writer's conference where the teacher pronounced it interesting. <laughs> the despised, dreaded word suggesting its potential as a novel was small. Small. At times, I still hear his voice in my head saying the word. I walk through the last room and out the side door. The brightness hits my eyes, a shattering kind of light in the dimness in the house. Anne waits beneath the tree. I was about to come look for you, she says, very motherly, strapping on her backpack and striding toward me across the yard. As we walk toward each other, a honeybee lights on my left shoulder. I come to an abrupt stop, watching it from the corner of my eye. Perhaps this visitation is nothing, but it feels purposeful. As Anne approaches, she reaches out reflexively to wave the bee away, and I put up my hand, shaking my head as if to say, no, it's a bee. <laughs> She steps back as she remembers our conversation and the connection dawns in her face. Oh, she says. <coughs> we stare at the bee, trying to be stock still, glancing at one another, making surprised faces. The bee is a mystery, a metaphor of pure synchronicity. I tell myself it is the imaginative eloquence of Mary Minutes go by, five, six, perhaps more. It occurs to us we can miss the bus. <laughs> we walk down the hill. The bee rides along. <laughs> What's with this bee, Anne says, genuinely affected? It's like it has adopted you. I look at her. I'm going to write the novel about the bees, I say. Wow. pleased if you had some questions and we could answer them for you. to name a character for my birth month, which is August. So it was a little fantasy, you know, that I used to tell my mother, I wish you'd name me August. <laughs> so I named what I thought of as the wisest woman in the book. <laughs> really wasn't modeled on me. <laughs> um, it was much more than others, I think, were modeled on me. Um, but I didn't, it didn't occur to me to name the other character, her sisters, after months, until one day, I mean, I had other names for them in my head, until one day I was struck by April, May, and June. And the reason was that my mother said something about my great aunts, and she said, you know, your, your um, grandfather's mother was crazy. <laughs> she named all of her children after flowers, and there was a rose and a violet and a lilac, and then there was like five flowers. And I went, months of the year, <laughs> April, May, June, and August, which just came to me because of that one comment. So um, you never know, you know, and I thought, that's crazy, isn't it? I don't care, I'm just gonna do it. <laughs> but I appreciate that you enjoyed the book. It's very nice to hear. Yes. Do you have any plans? 
tell you, my daughter and I, my daughter lives in Hawaii, and we do a Sunday conference call and we read books. And we read this book together. And I have to tell you, we cried on every phone call because it's just so moving for us. So please do another one. <laughs> Anything that works? No immediate plans for that, but I think we would both love to do work together again. So we do. Not yeah. We try, we sit and try to dream up things we can like together. <laughs> so we haven't come up with anything viable. Well, why don't you take another trip? <laughs> <laughs> I know, so so I'm afraid people will go, didn't they already write about that? <laughs> <laughs> we can take another country. But I think it's lovely that you and your daughter do that. It's really nice. So. Would you be willing to share your writing process just a little bit with us? Well, um, I write every day except weekends, and sometimes I'm, I'm being not good. I'll do that. My husband says it's bad. I shouldn't work on the weekends, but I get very immersed. And when I'm working in a book, I just go in that world, and I get very immersed. And if it wasn't for my dog Lily, I would probably be in there for you know 12 hours, which really isn't good for me. Um, so. I'm, I'm kind of a reformed person now. I only work normal eight or nine hours a day at my desk. Um, but I just love doing it, and I get a little lost in it. I, but, but my dog Lily will come in and um, put her head in my lap and bring a ball, and she'll, you know, after she's dropped a ball, she'll go get another one. That one didn't work, I'll go get another one. She'll bring in another one, drop that one, and look at me, and I'll finally say, I'm finishing, I'm wrapping this up, you know. So uh, my process is to, um, you know, have, have it more balanced because I get so absorbed in it. But um, then, however, I will say on my behalf, in my defense, that um, when I finish a book, I usually take six months off. Mm, I can understand. Because I feel like um, it's a very intense process, but I, I, I'm a firm believer in rotating the crops, I mean, these farmer metaphors. But you, you know, to let the field really be fallow and let, because you want, I think as a writer, you want your work to grow organically out of the soil of your own soul, of your own um, inner life, really. And um, creativity is really a conversation you have with yourself. So to have that authentic and organic, the, the seeds for your ideas, I think, need to grow up. And in order for that to happen, I think you need some time to allow those seeds to be there and to sprout. And you just begin to know, to rest yourself. So I do that. I'm very good about that part. Um, but Anne? Well, my schedule had everything to do with when my son went to school and when he got home. <laughs> so as, as soon as I got home, you know, with him, after picking him up from school, I would tell my husband, I'm off the clock. <laughs> and that, like, my writing day is done. And, um, which, you know, that was a good balance for me as well. Because when we were writing the book, it was just, it was a very, it felt very intensely written, you know. Um, so it was good after a, a writing day just to get on the floor and build some leather. <laughs> yes, right. I just wanted to say my book group is here tonight, and we read the book, and it just happened to be this month, so we were thrilled that you came at this particular time. And one of the things we wanted to know is, individually, are you writing um, a book or your plans? I'm working on my first novel, um, another first for me. Um, so I'm very excited about it, and I, I feel um, like I'm very immersed in getting to know this world and what these characters want, and what they're all about, and what they're you know, what they're after. So I feel very excited about uh, beginning, getting back to it. And I'm working on a novel too. So um, it's a seed of an idea I've been carrying around for a long time and I'm about to burst to get it written. So I've been doing a lot of research. It's a historical novel. So I'm not going to say 
a whole lot about what it's about because uh, it's so early in the process. I, I don't like to talk about it too much until I've written 200 pages and I'll start talking about it. Um, but um, I am also excited about it. And I'll just say it's um, set in the um, early part of the 19th century in Charleston, South Carolina. Yes. I was going to ask you um, where your inspiration for Lily came from. That book is my favorite book of all time. And um, then I heard you have a dog named Lily, so now I'm a little afraid to ask. <laughs> um, well, the dog came after my character. Okay. You'll be relieved to know. The dog did not inspire this character. Well, Although she could have, she's a great dog. <laughs> she's a black lab. Mm -hmm. Her her um, registered name is Lily's Black Madonna. Oh. And she's a beautiful, gorgeous dog. Um, her aunt has her brother, Lou. You know, why are we talking about dogs? I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, what was the question? <laughs> Where do I get the expression for Lily? Yeah. Um, well, I think I always knew that if I ever wrote a novel, it would be set in the summer of 1964, the first thing I ever wrote. And um, the character is a lot of like me in some ways, and but mostly not like me in my life. People always assume that the character was based on my life. I mean, you would not believe the people that come up to me and say, oh, you must have had a wretched childhood. <laughs> 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 Um, what with all that kneeling on grits and whatnot. <laughs> um, but I actually had a very wonderful childhood. My mother's still alive, um, 89 years old and alive and well. And I, But I think I conjured Lily out of my imagination, but she has some qualities like me. You know, she wanted to be a writer. Um, she rolled her hair on grape juice cans, and all these things that I borrowed little details, but the real essence and drive and thrust of her life, I, I made up. Um, so I think she was just inspired from memories I had of being in 1964 as an adolescent during a time of great racial divides, and that it, it was just an explosive time in American life, and I vividly lived it um, in my little hometown of Sylvester, Georgia, when Martin Luther King marched right down the Highway 82 near my home and was jailed. I mean, I remember all of those things. And I was um, the first integrated graduating high school class in my little town. Um, it was a painful time. And I had a sort of awakening that summer um, as a young high school student. And I was never the same. I think I was left littered with a lot of feelings I did not know how to digest and that I knew needed redemption. And my way to do that was to try to write about it in some way. So um, those were some of the inspirations for the story and this girl who emerged, who I wanted to go on a quest to find home and love and belonging. Maybe we have time for one more question in the back.
um, the depression. Um, there's so many, there's so much beauty out there in the world and in those cathedrals and in those black Madonnas, and it spoke to me so deeply. I mean, just to my soul, and it, it is in me to write and to create and to give expression to that. Um, so if someone translates that as selfish, yeah, I suppose that's his or her right to do so, but I, I could not have just the kind of person that I am, the kind of what I wanted, what I discovered I wanted to do to write, that it was in me. I couldn't not do it. Yeah. Well, there's, there's so much that could be said about that, um, yeah, but I think any authentic writing of the self um, we should encourage in our culture. It's, it's, I don't see it as a selfish thing. I mean, I suppose it could be in some cases where it is not propelled by something deeply authentic. But, um, you know, introspection is not selfish. Introspection is our way to understand our soul and therefore become more conscious and better citizens politically, um, personally, in our families, not just in relation to ourselves, but in relationship to what is other, um, and in our communities. The worst thing to me, the most selfish thing to me, is to sort of blindly ignore our own soul. And, and really all growth and consciousness starts in some sort of um, conversation we have with our inner life. So to have you know, writers who are able and willing to be vulnerable enough uh, to write honestly about this conversation they're having with their own soul um, is a gift to others. And I think it can be hard for some people to recognize that perhaps. I, I don't know whether this is the case, but it occurs to me that sometimes, uh, particularly as women, we are so um, entrained to not take care of ourselves and to have these intense conversations with our own life and to take the time to reflect on our lives and to even articulate our lives, and to find our voice, and to offer our voice to the world through whatever means, whether it's art or writing, or to travel and to see what kinds of conversations it evokes in us and how that changes us, because that becomes like a little hothouse, really, for us to encounter ourselves. Um, to bring that back, I mean, this is the great mono myth, you know, that Joseph Campbell wrote about. It's to go on this uh, great adventure, to become more conscious, and to return to your community and offer that gift. And that's the story. And that's what um, I think brings about the change in culture that we so often need, is the deeper kind of response. Now, I don't know, you know, well aware that all books aren't written from that standpoint. Um, but that's how I feel about it, and I think that should be encouraged instead of dismissed and looked down upon. And I often wonder when I hear that if perhaps that person may or may not be sort of stuck in some belief that maybe um, their life, their, there's some fear of examining their own life, or there's some resistance to doing it, or they're so enmeshed in this idea that they can only be available to other people and not to themselves. I mean, there's all kinds of interesting things, or maybe they're just right. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but those are so many thoughts I have about it. And I'll just say one last thing. Um, there's a curious paradox that goes on in writing memoir. I mean, if you were to ask me, are you, what, who are you? You know, I'd try to give you some. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> you know, big answer like, you know, I'm the, we're, we're the true self or something, <laughs> some mystical answer. But in the roles that we play, I would say, you know, I'm a novelist and I'm a memoirist. That's what I do. And I have learned from personal experience that in writing memoir, 
the deeper I go into my own experience, the more freeing it is for me to connect with other people. And I don't understand that, but I know it's true. And this is the great discovery that Thomas Merton made. You know, I, I love Thomas Merton, the monk, and um, his writings. And he was standing on the, I was in Louisville, Kentucky, actually, yesterday, you know, when I were. <laughs> and so this is fresh on my mind, because we were driving in the streets, and we passed the corner of Fourth and Walnut, and I went, oh. He wrote, and it brought it all back to me, he wrote that he had come to Louisville uh, for a doctor's appointment. You know, he was a monk in the monastery of Gethsemane outside of Louisville for his, you know, much of his life at this point. And he's cloistered there. He was a Travis there. He didn't speak in the silence. But he comes into Louisville. He's standing on the corner of 4th and Walnut. And he suddenly has his great awakening where he looks around him and he is flooded with love for every person he sees and he feels deeply connected to them and he feels a sense of community and he understands that his whole life of solitude and silence and introspection and conversation with his own soul has brought him to compassion and to this outward thrust of his life so I remember that, you know, what I read as I was in Louisville yesterday, and I think this is in some much smaller scale true for the memoirist, that the deeper you go into your own experience, it somehow brings you into the lives of other people, and those boundaries disappear. Why am I preaching a sermon? I feel like <laughs> Feelings about it, obviously. Yeah. That's, that's a few of them. I could go on. Yeah. 